yard gains. He was like in rarefied air in terms of his ability to create those explosive plays. Like you'd think you'd want to get the ball into that guy's hands a little bit more with he can. You'd think maybe- that, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome into the Hot Read Podcast for Tuesday, May the 16th. I'm your host, Easton Fries, director of published content here at broadwaysportsmedia.com. We're also brought to you by the 440 Podcast Network, and I'm joined, as always, by producer JT. JT, how are you? <laughs> You're muted, JT. I'm muted, of course. We, we lo- lovely start to our Tuesday uh, afternoon yeah, here. We here. We're, we're, getting, we're, getting a great, we're getting a great start here. <laughs> Not a great start, but a great show today. We've got an awesome yes. special guest that is waiting behind the wings, so we will make him wait no longer. We can go ahead and bring him in. It's Danny Kelly, our guy who is the senior staff writer over at The Ringer, co-host of The Ringer NFL Draft Show, The Ringer NFL Fantasy Football Show, author of The Ringer's NFL Draft Guide, and co-author of The Ringer's Fantasy Football Rankings, Danny Kelly. What's going on, man? So excited to have you on with us today. What's up, fellas? How are we doing? Great, great. Um, we're talking about all of the fun off-season things. You know, this this time of year yeah. is uh, he's really scraping the bottom of the barrel for content. So we're clinging on to <laughs> the draft a little bit. We we first met you in Indianapolis at the combine, so our our relationship yeah. began draft related. Um, and I hit you up and was like, let's talk a little bit of draft. And you were gracious enough to join us today. So that's where we'll start today. We can we can talk about the Titans draft in particular, which in the grand scheme of things. Um, it started as one of the more boring draft classes and then became one of the more interesting draft classes when they went with Will Levis in round two. Um, certainly one that has fans of split mind here in Nashville. They um, Some of them aren't quite happy with the direction, even though this is a team that desperately needed offense and they did draft all offense. But in the NFL and today, uh, today's NFL, that is, it's like if it's not wide receiver, people are upset and it wasn't wide receiver. Right. So um, let's start with the first guy that went with Peter Skaronsky. Among one of the safest picks, I think, in this draft, but boring for a lot of fans, right? Who wants right. a who wants a lineman in round one? For this team, you'd think of all the teams whose fan base might actually want a lineman, it might be this one because of how unbearable the pass protection has been for this team for the past two years. Um, but alas, folks weren't super happy about it. And it had it came down to the positional debate, right? Tackle guard, mm-hmm. positional value. So run down a little bit for us your evaluation of Peter Skaronsky pre-draft and then maybe talk a little bit about where you think he may best fit in the NFL. Yeah. I mean, he's he was one of my favorite players in this class period. He's he's a really good player, very balanced, very strong, uh versatile. I think he comes in and he can play either tackle or guard for the Titans and I think, you know, that versatility, that ability to uh just lock down a position is going to be very valuable for the for the Titans. You're right. It's definitely a boring pick it's it's you know especially a guy like Skaronsky who you know I don't if I I don't think I could pick him out of a lineup honestly I don't really know what he looks like I mean, he's <laughs> exactly. like a good watched him uh you know obviously in pads and everything and in a helmet but um not a flashy player no not not like a big ticket item t- t- necessarily so I think you know obviously I can understand some of the disappointment but at the same time um you know I I really like him. I think he's a really good player. And the way that the draft played out in terms of getting Skaronsky and then getting Levis also in the second round Mm -hmm. um, is almost ideal, honestly, for the Titans because then they kind of double up. They get a really good player first. I was a little bit nervous, you know, for any team, really, honestly, that took Levis in the first round because there's just a lot of risk there. But I think taking him in the second round, you get actually a really good amount of value with that pick. And again, like I said, you get Skaronsky, who's going to protect for him in the long term. Um, and probably I think do a very good job. I had him ranked uh, sixth overall on my board. So, you know, I, I understand the positional, you know, discussion, whether a guard is worth it at number 11 overall. Um, but at the same time, you know, for a team with the identity that the Titans have, which is balance and smash mouth, and they still have Derrick Henry, you know, I, it just kind of fits their identity and, and their philosophy. So I like to pick actually. I liked it as well. And, and the thing that we keep talking about, Danny, is like with a brand new GM, which Rand Carthen is, you're you're probably with your first ever draft pick looking to maybe not hit a home run, but just hit a double, something that you know is not going to come back right. and look horrible for you. And I can't think of a better double in this draft class than Peter Skaronsky. And so that, that makes a yep. lot of sense as to why they ended up going with him. Um, we can talk about Levis because that's really, that was the, the, the main top topic of discussion with this draft class. And it was Titans fans were so, so tight the night of the draft leading up to that pick because they were terrified. You know, we're in, we're in volunteer country here 
And so there's there's an <laughs> added bias of it's not just Will Levis might not be a good NFL quarterback. It is we hate Will Levis as a person. And this is the church of <laughs> anti Will Levis propaganda right. around here. And so it's 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 tough to like it take the it means more SEC bias out of the NFL evaluation for a lot of folks. And so there were a lot of people terrified of them taking him at 11. And frankly, mm. I think if Skaronsky wasn't passed over by the Bears, they probably were thinking about it. That's kind of right. what they've alluded to. Yeah. Um, but then ending up with him at 33 overall, just from an objective standpoint, I, I, I really can't be upset with that value, right? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. This is a guy, I had him ranked 21st. I think he was a back half of the first round type of quarterback. There's some issues, I think, that are a little bit concerning that would make me a little worried to take him in the top 10, top five type of, right. type of thing. You know, he's a little bit older. Uh, his play fell off a little bit in this last season, and so there's some concerns there. Uh, you know, he didn't necessarily light it up on the scoreboard in terms of his stats uh, this last season or really, you know, ever in, in college. There were some issues with turnovers and things like that, but the traits uh, mm -hmm. 100% make him, to me, a like a back half of the first round guy worth betting on um, because he, you know, 6'4", 229, athletic and you know coming coming into the draft it was hard because i kept going back and forth on levis um on one hand i wanted to like him on the other hand there was some concerns that i had that you know just kind of were nagging in the back of my mind but at the same time man he has an insanely good arm like his arm oh yeah the 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 speed at which he gets it out the, the speed at which he releases the football it's wild can, like a short compact flick of the wrist throw absolutely great velocity. It's almost reminiscent of like Aaron Rodgers, the way he throws the football. So I understand why right. teams liked him, even though, like I said, there's, there's some obvious concerns, but um, you know, there's, there's traits to work with there. So I think where the Titans got him is almost honestly perfect because there's now probably not going to be as much of a rush to get him on the field yep. um, in theory, you know, unless Ryan Tannehill completely sucks, you know, in 2023, assuming right. he's the starter, you know, there's not going to be a huge, huge rush to get him on the field. There's not going to be that pressure. You know, the second round is just perfect, honestly. And so you guys can develop him um, and hopefully he turns into a starter. And if he doesn't, then it's not the end of the world. So um, right. it, it worked out really well, I think, for the Titans. I, I felt like I was taking crazy pills with him the entire draft season because early on, I remember on y'all's show, it, Ben Solak talking about like, I don't be surprised if a team falls in love with this guy, potential yep. first overall pick. And then you heard that from folks in the media and different teams. And I'm like, that's crazy. And then you hear when we get right. into the month of March and April, it's like, actually, Will Levis isn't really a first rounder and he's guaranteed to he's actually just Jake Locker. And I'm like, that's crazy. He, it's like we can't you know, you can't possibly have nuance in today's world. Um, <laughs> right. Maybe he's just the fourth best quarterback in a class of four good quarterbacks. Um, right. But but I do think that in terms of landing spot, and that's kind of where we'll talk about with the rest of the AFC South in a couple of minutes, I, I couldn't think of a better situation than him being able to go and sit behind. I mean, my, my NFL comps for him were like kind of Ryan Tannehill, best case, yeah. Matthew Stafford. And for him to come and sit behind Ryan Tannehill for him as a player has to be one of the better situations, right? Yeah. And I, tr I comped him to Ryan Tannehill in my, in my yeah. draft guide. So, which is why a lot of people were upset because they want to get rid of Ryan Tannehill and they're like, <laughs> See, that's crazy. Bring the new one in. <laughs> it's just that that's hilarious to me yes. because man, fan bases and I, and I've gone through this, you know, in with the Seahawks mm -hmm. over the years and. Uh, fans always kind of the grass is always greener. I think Ryan Tannehill's a pretty good starter. You know, you could be you could be way worse off in terms of yes, uh, starting quarterback. 100%. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I think stylistically they're similar. I think Levis is going to work best in a system where he has some support around him. They're you know run heavy or at least balanced, and then you know play action, throw it deep, explosive plays, let him run around a little bit because he is he is pretty athletic. He almost had sort of a Taysom, Taysom Hill vibe early in his career in college at Penn yeah, State. Yeah, he did. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, again, there's tools to work with. There's there's traits to develop. I don't think he's a complete product. And obviously the worry is he's a little old, so is he ever going to get there? But now the situation dictates. And, and situation's important. We talk about this on our show all the time. Situation's probably the most important thing. It's the most thing. underrated part of the whole yeah. the process, Yeah. It, it, like he's not going to be asked to put this team on his shoulders right away. And that's mm -hmm. so massively important. That actually gives him in my mind, a much better chance of, of succeeding in the NFL. If you would have come in 
and was a top 10 pick and everyone's clamoring for him to be the starter in year one. He oh, goes out him on there, Houston, he Like it was rumored forever. And he's just, yeah. he dies. Then I'm like, yeah, there's no shot. I would have almost zero confidence that he would succeed in the NFL. Yeah. And now I have pretty strong confidence that <laughs> right. he'll at least be a starter in the league. And so, and again, by the way, this like, like from a, you know, personality wise chip on the shoulder thing. Like maybe he's got this like new, you know, fire under him and he's been humbled sure. maybe a little bit or whatever. Like there's also some of the personality things that could come into this of him falling. And now he's got that chip on his shoulder and he really wants to prove people wrong. So, um, yeah, again, I like before the draft, I was like low and, and you meant you kind of alluded to it, but I, I think we beat him up a little bit too much throughout mm -hmm. the process. He's a better prospect than maybe we were kind of letting on when we were, you know, talking about some of the issues like the bananas, eating the bananas and, and you <laughs> the know, mayo. the weird stuff, the mayo and the coffee. Yeah. But like, uh, honestly, you know, I, I think he has the traits to actually be a starter in the league. And so um, that's got to be exciting. I, I think it should be exciting for Titans fans. The third round pick for the Titans was Ty J Spears, who has it's like it's two different things like this guy's got crazy juice. He also has half the ACLs you'd expect in a quarter in a, in a running back. <laughs> one um, half of them. What, yeah. One half. Exactly half the quota. You're usually that's the benchmark for most teams right. uh, is two ACLs. Um, but the ACL issue aside. This guy brings juice to an offense that really could use some juice. And so yeah. I'm kind of surprised fans aren't more excited about him. I think that they saw that headline um, and with the injury PTSD that Titans fans have had from the past two years, it was immediate red flags for them. But yeah. it, when you watch the tape from last year, which I know that you did, this guy's this guy's electricity in a bottle. Like he's going to bring yeah. something to this Titans offense that they've not had in a long time. Derrick Henry is great, but this guy is completely different. He feels different to me than anybody that's on that roster too. It's not like yes. Hassan Haskins, Julius Chestnut, whoever ends up being sort of in the rotation at running back. Mm -hmm. Um you know, he's totally different from those guys. He is a little bit smaller. I think that's kind of another yep. concern that you have and why he's probably never going to be, you know, a Derrick Henry guy where you're, you're giving him 300 carries in a season or whatever. Um, obviously with the knee, that's also an issue, but like, I don't, I don't worry too much about the knee running back careers are already short. Um, you and know, that's I think my he point has, was, I was told that you're not supposed to sign running backs to a second deal. I mean, yeah, so. they're not, they're not going to sign him to a second deal unless it's like, uh, couple million or whatever right um and so you know i don't think you worry too much about that i think in the short term like you mentioned he offers the type of juice he's a he's a lightning element to the to the to complement the the thunder that derrick henry brings and yeah. you know the thing that i've noticed first about him i think the first thing i wrote is that he has lightning quick acceleration just yep. juice just burst to make the first guy miss you know get out to the edge he can access, you know, gaps in the line that probably Derrick Henry is a little too slow to get to at this point in his mm -hmm. career. So that kind of gives you, you know, it's a change up almost it's it, for defenders. It's, you know, they're getting used to Derrick Henry having to take this guy on in the hole. And, you know, that bring, that's like a whole different style than what you have to do when you're, when you're trying to tackle Tajay Spears. So I think, you know, just a change up, honestly, in the, in the offense, it's kind of interesting. Plus, you know, he, he didn't do a ton of pass catching, in college, but I saw him at the senior bowl and he was very impressive in that area. Um, yeah. there was, he was making guys miss, making guys miss after the catch and, and, you know, running routes. And he looked pretty impressive, honestly. And they I were lining him up the slot a, big... a lot at rookie mini camp this past weekend. They, they did Perfect. a bunch of stuff with him. Yeah. And I love that about that. And, you know, they, the Titans have, uh, could run out two running back sets and, and kind of see how that goes. And so, yep. um, yeah, I think he's just another, like third round pick is, you know, honestly, just, uh, not, I mean, it's not worth a whole lot. Like third, like once you get past the second round, it's like, you're kind of throwing darts. Honestly, I know third rounders yep. feel like it's higher, but like mm -hmm. you know, third rounders are hitter, very hit or miss. And so um, I don't think it's a huge investment in a guy that could bring a little electricity to the offense. And, you know, if he doesn't work out long term, that's not the end of the world, because again, you're not wanting to give running backs big second contracts anyway. And, and a third round pick is not, you know, that high of a, a commitment. So um, I like the pick. I like, you know, I think it makes sense for a team that has Derrick Henry kind of getting towards the end of his career and think, probably yeah. only going to be in Tennessee for another year. And you got to mm -hmm. get some more depth there. You got to get, um, you know, get another compliment to what, what you guys have going on there. So uh, I like the pick. The last draft pick we'll talk about is Josh Wiley, who not a, a ton to discuss because, you know, he was it is a really deep tight end class. So he was one of yeah. a number of guys that you felt like was a, a good value proposition on day three. But we on this show, we weren't actually all that crazy about him as a fit for them. 
because mm. they've got Chikakonkwo, who had such a great rookie year, showed that he has that, at least in the receiving game, that tight end one capability in, in this receiving room is going to be a big part of the receiving game. Yeah. They really need somebody who can be that. Um, you know, you put them on the field, you're not quite sure what, because that, that's been their problem, right? They've had tight ends that are all or nothing as a blocker or a pass catcher. And when you don't have a guy that's versatile in that way, the defense knows exactly the kind of play coming based on the personnel. And so they, right. we, you know, we're, we were hoping for them to find somebody to be that tight end to that is a threat in both ways with Wiley. We just didn't really see a lot of that. He's a big, tall athlete. You know, I think he's going to be a, a nice guy and short yardage in the passing game, but he's like six 11 or something. I, I was standing next to him at, <laughs> he's at tall. rookie mini camp yeah. this weekend. And it's like, this dude is one of the, he's like lineman tall on this team. Yeah. Um, is he going to be able to even get low enough to be a factor in the in the blocking game, let alone be heavy enough? I didn't see a ton of that on tape. What did you see? Yeah, I think, I mean, honestly, there's a reason guys are fifth round picks. I don't think he was an elite in either blocking or receiving, but he is a big, tall athlete that yes. you know can move around. They moved him around their offense a lot in terms of the formation. He was doing slice blocks, moving around in the backfield, blocking. Um you know, I could see him being pretty useful on the move as a blocker. You know what I mean? Like getting out in space, targeting guys. He's pretty good at that. Um, sealing them off. I don't know if he's necessarily going to be like a big pile pusher type player. His his arm length is a little bit of a concern, I think, as as like an in line blocker, and and that could right. be something that you have to sort of just temper your expectations a little bit. But um, you know, as a guy who can move around. I think that they can pair him with Chig. Chig. Every time he touched the football, it felt like it was an explosive play. And so, you know, getting him out in yes. space on screens, running like 12 personnel or whatever, or, or 21 personnel, um, or sorry, 12 personnel or 22 personnel, getting two tight ends on the field. There um, it is. Uh -huh. It's it's the offseason. I'm rusty. But um, but yeah. Um, yes, yeah, fair enough. Yeah. Getting getting him out in space. I'm talking about Chig and, and then letting maybe Wiley do some blocking in space downfield. I think. There's a lot of things that you guys could do with that. He kind of reminds me a little bit of, you know, uh, a Troutman type of tight end where you're probably not going to expect numbers from him, but he's going to mm. be a utility guy on the offense that just kind of goes out there and does the dirty work. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, there's like you said, there's not a ton to say about this pick probably, um, but he's a big, big, tall, athletic tight end that they could use in multiple ways. So we've already talked about Levis and his landing spot with Tennessee. Let's look at the rest of the quarterbacks in this draft class. And it's easy for us to talk about that because it's the AFC South and Carolina. Um, yeah. It's it's the ultimate AFC South quarterback arms race now with Trevor Lawrence being the elder statesman of the, the new guard, <laughs> assuming that all these new guys eventually take over, um, which is exciting. Like uh, as somebody that covers the Titans and the AFC South, I'm, I'm selfishly hoping they all hit so that it's just pandemonium in two years. And it, yep. it goes like full NFC East, the laughing stock in the league to, oh, now they're the best division in the league. Um, but let's start with with Houston and CJ Stroud. It was always Stroud that nobody believes them when they say that. Um, <laughs> what do you think about that fit? And what do you think about the idea that that the owner definitely didn't have any say in who they ended up picking a quarterback? Oh man, I don't know. It, it's tough because you hear, I've heard both sides of the story like that. It was always their pick and they just did a really good job right. of hiding it. And I can actually see that honestly, because, um, Casario is so just maniacal about that kind of thing. I, I could see that having actually He's a been sneaky the case. one. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but I also heard, you know, you hear, you heard a lot on draft day that, that the owner stepped in. I don't know. I, I would lean, um, that they always had him highly graded. And they just did a good job of, of doing the smoke screen. Um, but to, and part of that maybe is just me projecting my view of him. I always thought he was, to me, he was the best quarterback in the class, <laughs> slightly above Bryce Young, just because the worries right. I have with Bryce Young in terms of his frame. I, honestly, Bryce Young is the best quarterback, quote unquote, quarterback in this class. But I have legitimate concerns about his size. I think that right. you know, you'd be a little bit delusional if you don't have actual concerns about how big he is because he's – you know, an, an extreme outlier in terms of the history of the NFL. So that worries me. Um, but yeah, I mean, CJ Stroud to me, very good, accurate passer, good arm, you know, cerebral, he move around. I think he, he got beat up a lot during the process for not being able to do things out of, out of structure, but I do think he showed flashes enough for me to know or, or believe that he can do that in the NFL Yeah, coming into an offense with Bobby Slowick, you know, the quote unquote Shanahan, 
McVay style offense, I think is a perfect fit for him. I like that. They've got some, some veteran guys around him and Robert Woods and, and Dalton Schultz kind of give him a little bit of support early on. Obviously that's not like an elite pass catching core in Houston, but um, you know, it, it, at least right. they have the makings of a good offensive line and a few skill players that can kind of just get the job done in, in the type of offense that he's going to be running. So overall, I'm, I'm pretty interested to see what happens with, with Stroud in Houston. I think it was the right pick for them. Um, I'm glad you know, that he, I was a little worried that he was going to fall because it felt like, you know, there was a lot of whispers coming out that, that the NFL didn't like Stroud as much as maybe I did. So um, I felt a little bit validated that, you know, I saw, I was seeing the same things they were seeing. Um, let's talk about as, as you all have deemed him on the ringer shows, future hall of famer, Anthony Richardson, who I, I am very high on um, and just in the draft process. I mean, there's, there's a, a whole lot to love obviously and he goes to indianapolis which in hindsight kind of always made sense with shane steichen and what he did with jalen hurts right um but it, jacob asks in the comments here how patient will indy be with richardson that was a pretty tense war room when he got picked i i do wonder um you know they they're a team that is in a position where i, th I think they're going to want to start him early he's only played 12 games since high school or only started 12 games since high school so like he definitely needs the reps but do you see him um, being like a, a decent? I, I kind of am expecting a a, a um, Justin Fields kind of season for him, where at the very least with his legs he'll wow us. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. I think um, he's probably going to take his lumps as a passer. I think everybody should be ready for that. Everybody should expect yeah. that he'll have some struggles as a passer. Um, most rookie quarterbacks do. Even the most like refined college passers you know i can think back of the last like 10 years some of the most refined passers in college like a trevor lawrence for instance you know they take their lumps in in their rookie season there's the the speed is different the complexity you know obviously the offenses in, in the nfl are so much more complex but i i do think the landing spot's perfect and like you said in retrospect it makes so much sense that uh shane steichen um you know would would make this pick or at least want to uh try and develop this guy and so um you know, put him on the Jalen Hurts style plan where you have him heavily involved in the run game. That's a very difficult thing for any defense to defend. It gives you a foundation to build your offense on. You got Jonathan Taylor. You can build the run game around that. Um, and so and then from there, obviously, just kind of get him comfortable as a passer, get him sort of ingrained in the offense, learn the language and, and kind of go from there. I would expect he probably puts up a good amount of yards on the ground, scores a lot of touchdowns in the red zone but his passing numbers are pretty underwhelming and, and that would be honestly fine. I think that's just kind of like what we should expect and, um, you know, not be too worried about it if it does happen that way. Kenneth, along with a number of Titans fans have this question and it's going to be the question for the foreseeable future. We know that the Titans kind of backed off potentially going up to three when Stroud was off the table in Houston, but they could have seemingly gone up to three still to get Richardson if they were high on him. Obviously, they were higher on Levis than Richardson. What what would you have liked better? Them selling the farm to move up to three and take a swing on on Richardson as a prospect? Yeah. Or do you like the the value of Levis at, at 33? If I'm a Titans fan, I mean, obviously, it's exciting. It, it would be very exciting to have a guy like Anthony Richardson in the building. Um I just worry. I, I think I would worry a little bit too much that if you give up the farm to move up and get a guy like Richardson, you already don't have a ton of skill player talent. Um, you know, you're kind of in a weird exactly. transition season where, you know, building around him quickly would be difficult and you're giving up a ton of, you know, draft capital to move up there. And so you're almost paying yourself into a corner where, you know, if Richardson struggles early on, things could really sort of snowball against you quickly. So, I probably like realistically, if I'm being rational, think it was a better move to wait, get Levis in the second round and long-term you still have, you know, your future picks. You can kind of take this thing slowly. And but it's and, not as fun to think about, right? It, that's for sure. I, but like, I mean, honestly, the traits wise, obviously <laughs> right. Richardson is more, you know, elite in every category. Um, but like I said, Will Levis does have pretty exciting traits too. And so they can do some similar things with, with him. It's just not going to be, the most athletic quarterback of, of all time kind of deal. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I probably, if I'm talking rationally, the, the, the Titans made the right decision, not trying to give up the farm to move up for a guy like Richardson, because there's just a lot of variance with quarterbacks period. And, and he's probably 
more high variance than most guys just because of his lack of experience, you know, in, in college. Let's talk about little Bryce over in Carolina. Um, I think it, I don't know if it was you or somebody else on y'all's take purge uh, podcast you did before the draft, but just the idea that Bryce is he's going to die in the NFL. That's that's what I'm I think that what we're all terrified of. And, you know, you you see these videos that have come out this past weekend and he just looks straight up like a make a wish kid back there behind yeah. that offensive line. There's no other way to put it. First of all, do you buy this? He may not be the starter discussion. Um, and also, what do you think he will look like this first season in terms of the you know landing spot for a first overall pick? Usually worse than this Carolina situation. I actually do like um, where he ended up landing in terms of how bad it could have been. What are your thoughts on Young? Yeah, I think in our uh, in our take purge, I was essentially like my take was that all the outliers are going to fail because that's what outliers, that's why they're outliers. Like the <laughs> NFL generally <laughs> avoids yeah, right, guys right. that are outliers because it's harder for them to succeed. I, yeah. I do think that yeah. Bryce Young has some special uh, ability in terms of his vision on the field, his ability to like process what's going on downfield and, and coverages and where his guys are going to be. Like he can spin away from pressure, spin away like three times and still know where everybody is on the board. And so that's like a special trait that he has. But at the same time, you know, he's tiny, he's small. And that shows up in his ability to drive the football. It shows up in his ability to see, you know, over the middle of the field. I think that that's going to be an issue with, that we see with pretty much every small quarterback. You have to have, you have to find passing lanes. And if it gets too crowded in the middle of the field, he's going to want to bail and that could be, you know, an issue. And so I don't know. It, it, I, to me, and I said, uh, this is basically a good, like an offshoot of what we were just talking about with trading up for the farm for a guy like Bryce. This is what the Panthers did. They traded a huge amount of capital to move up and get a guy who's already a yeah. outlier. And so that to me feels like it, it feels like a, like a, they're doubling down or, or this is a parlay of sorts where any rookie quarterback is going to be a risk, but now they're doubling that risk because they traded up and, and all that. And so I'm a little just worried about the situation. That is all. I, I love Bryce as a player. I think he's really, he had, like I said, he has some special traits in terms of his ability to process, but I do worry about just the physicality uh, being a, a long-term issue in the NFL. And so, yeah, I'm a little bit worried about that. I, I think their offensive line is going in the right direction. I think their skill players are not very good um, at least right away. So I'm a little bit worried about this. Yeah. Um, let's get to some other draft topics, interests, and oddities, just to kind of put a bow on this, the, on the, on the topic of wide receivers, the middle class of this wide receiver group ended up slipping a lot further than I think maybe we all talked ourselves into them slipping. Um, we, we ended up having what, four or five wide receivers in the first round, which people didn't really see coming. Yeah. But yeah. then it was kind of a desert for a while and everyone felt like a full round. You had, you know, the 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 two Tennessee boys and Marvin Mims and all these guys going like the third, fourth, fifth, sixth round. You've got A.T. Perry av available in the seventh round. It's like, what's happening? Do, yeah. do you think we just got way too excited about wide receiver as a position in the draft process? Or do you think the NFL has a good reason for being down on this group? Um. Yeah, I think both probably yes. In terms of we probably got a little too excited about. Okay. The, I think well, first of all, you know, I, I was always kind of clear eyed. I thought I think that there's going to be some contributors, some starters in this group. I actually, you know, I'd still say that there's going to be some very good players that emerge from this draft class in terms of the receiver position. But at the same time, we saw what I was a little bit worried would happen is a lot of these tiny guys fell a bit um, because they're tiny and they're outliers, and so. Um, you know, we can't, I, this happens every year though. We get the, the NFL drafts players in a weird order. Like the order of which these running our receivers came off the board. Right. Is very shocking to me, honestly, like uh, Jaden Reed being the, I think it was the fifth or sixth guy. Taken. Michael Wilson, come on down. Michael Wilson was a third rounder. Josh Downs fell a little bit further than I thought, but that I guess makes sense in retrospect. You kind of, this happens in, in every draft where you look back and you're like, ah, oh, that kind of makes sense. Like Josh Downs, he's a slot receiver only um you know he's probably he's not as explosive straight line speed as, as some of these other small guys and so it kind of makes sense that he went behind a guy like yeah. tank dell um 
So, and Rasheed Rice going to, to the Chiefs in the second round was a big shock to me. So there's there's always this kind of thing. Jonathan Mingo going that early in the second round was a little bit surprising. Um, so yeah, the order in which these guys came off the yep. off the board was a little weird and a little surprising, but it happens. It does happen every year. You know, if you look back at the classes over the last few seasons, like the the order in which these guys are taken is always a little bit surprising. So um, yeah, I think there is a, a few starters in here. The At Perry thing that you mentioned, I thought that was a weird fall i was a little surprised he fell in the sixth round it sounds like he was told the feedback was that he had some character issues that teams were worried about he didn't really expound on that but um and i haven't really been mm. able to figure out what the what the issue there was but yeah he was a guy that i had in my top 100 i think he's a good player and so they get it i think they got a steal the saints got a steal in the sixth round getting a guy like that so um but yeah there's probably more role players and stars in this group but at the same time i think there are going to be some pretty productive pros here Danny, your Seahawks, I'm very bullish on, and I want I want to hear your brief thoughts on their draft. They had ten gajillion picks, yeah. um, of which, of course, they took a running back that everybody's like, "Why, God, why?" They took two uh, in the fantasy community, at least. Like, <laughs> and walk. They, 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 who they? Who else did they take besides Charbonnet? Uh, they took uh, Kenny McIntosh in the seventh round. Okay, well, that and then that, that that is not the most Seahawks thing ever. I don't know what is. Yeah. Um. What What did you think? I, I just I see this team that was supposed to be horrible last year. And then they're a playoff team. Yeah. And they kind of don't lose anybody and just add some pieces that I think are going to be really nice. Like the defense still has a lot of question marks, but they were a winning team last year with even more question marks than they currently have. I don't see why this team shouldn't be, especially in a really, really weak NFC. Yeah. Shouldn't be like a team that people are really fond of. I'm sure you're really excited about this season. Yeah. I think, you know, the way that things have worked out in the post Russell Wilson era is, is pretty shocking and, and crazy. Honestly, like it is Russell, Russell leaving and immediately <laughs> yes. starting like to completely suck and then get like giving them a really high pick out of it. Um, <laughs> the Seahawks absolutely nailing yep. what I think there were last two drafts. Obviously we'll see what time will tell what happens with the 2023 draft, but the 2022 draft was ex- extremely good. Um, got starters at, in Tariq Woolen, who is like a star immediately. I'm really excited about the the Tariq Wall and Devon yep. Witherspoon or Devin Witherspoon connection or, or, or combination. I think that they're very different players, but they both yes. give the uh, the team the ability to do a lot of different things in, the, in their secondary. And so um, I think, yeah, there's still some worries in terms of what they got up front. Their beef up front is is very much a question mark, I think, in, on defense and their ability to like get after the passer. They have to have some guys take jumps this this year to uh, to field a good defense because they their defense was really bad last year or at least very below average. And so, you know, getting the defense kind of going, which has been a work in progress for, for, you know, defensive head coach and Pete Carroll for, for what feels like a really long time. So hopefully they kind of turn the corner here. They got Bobby Wagner back, which is fan service and it fills a huge need. Um, (laughs) You know, they, they went and signed Jermont Jones, which is, I think a lot of fun. I think he's a good player, up and coming player, ascending player. And so, yeah, I mean, I love Jackson Smith and Jigwood. I mean, he was like, honestly, one of my favorite players in this class period. So landing with the Seahawks, I think is great. He's a yes. fit for what they need to do. Totally. They haven't had a third receiver, um, you know, with the Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf combo. They haven't had a third guy step up, um, you know, in, in a couple of years. So he could be that guy and give them not only the, the another guy to like convert third downs and, and things like that in the short and intermediate area, but just give them more depth and uh, a backup plan. If Tyler Lockett or DK Metcalf got hurt. Um, their offense isn't going to fall apart in theory. So yeah, I, I like their draft a lot. You know, the, the running back pick in the second round, just classic Pete Carroll, classic John Schneider. Um, but that's just what they do. You kind of just have to live with it. But overall, I really liked it. <laughs> right. So speaking of, of classics here, it's, it's the Falcons going with yet another skill player in the top 10. They go with Bijan Robinson, who is, you know, aside from positional value, which there's a serious debate. I saw somebody um, have some graphic from like CBS or something on, on Twitter the other day is like, even if Bijan is a hall of famer, it was still a bad pick. That's <laughs> cool. Um, Bijan added to that room just, just from a, from a fun standpoint, electric. I know that yeah. you as a fantasy guy, um, very love hate relationship and mostly hate with, with the coach down there, Arthur Smith. Yeah. We're very familiar with him in Nashville, of course. What what do you what do you think about that fit and the a monster squad they put together of just athlete <laughs> skill players um, with with the the most underwhelming quarterback to helm it all up 
um, who yeah, yeah. we know the Ben Solex of the world are crazy on, but everybody else is just like, why, why him? Uh, what do you think about that from, from a real yeah. world perspective, but then also fantasy wise is, is, is he already a top five pick? Like uh, he's gotta yeah. be up there, right? I would say so. Yeah. I mean, so first of all, it, the Falcons are drafting like they're a, a Madden franchise or something like that. Just like the most exciting, sexy players in the top a thousand percent. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, yeah. I respect it and I enjoy it and I think it's fun. And I, I we've had a bit on our show of, that we hate Arthur Smith. And I think we probably have right. gone a little bit too far. We've beaten him up a little bit too much. I think at the end of the day, we probably should have been <laughs> complaining more about Marcus Mariota because he can't freaking hit a guy over the middle of the field on a seam route. Um, Kyle Pitts is, is the classic we're example. Aware. Like, yeah, yeah. He, he, Pitts, his underlying numbers were actually really good. Like he was, you know, I think top three in target rate for the tight end position. So obviously I, we were a little bit bitter because we hyped up to Kyle Pitts a lot in the off season. And then, you know, it felt like they weren't targeting him enough, even though they were technically doing it. it you had more be. yards than Kyle Pitts this week. Yeah. My favorite bit on your <laughs> yeah, show last year. Like some random fucking guy. Uh, but yeah, it, I think this but year made up name, not even real. <laughs> Literally. I mean, we, I, there were weeks where guy I'd never heard of was like outscoring Kyle Pitts. So um, that was always fun. But at yeah. the same time, you know, I, I do think, the way that they're building their offense, you would like to see them have a little bit better situation at quarterback, but they're doing a good job of building everywhere else for, you know, whether it's Ritter taking a jump in, in year two, or they end up with a guy next year, you know, whatever down the line. Um, I think they are setting it up where they have the support system, the foundation in place there offensively to, to have a good offense. Bijan is a very, very good running back. Drake London, very good receiver, and Kyle Pitts, very good receiver too. I mean, he's more of a receiver than tight end, honestly. And so, um, yeah, I think the the skill player talent they have there is really, really fun, and I'm excited to see how it all kind of goes. I really hope Desmond Ritter can just like not airmail a pass over Kyle Pitts's head by ten yards every time he gets open downfield. <laughs> like that's my only hope for this year. <laughs> I mean, what we saw from last year, like right. so far, so well, good a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Like I think he's, I, he, he's better than Mariota. So I, and maybe I'm with yes. Ben on just the minority here that I think that everything's in place for Desmond Ritter, Ritter to ex- succeed. He yeah. just like needs to do the bare minimum here. <laughs> if he's <laughs> so not like, good with this situation, he's just not good. Right. Yeah. There's no way. And it's, it's a good way. It, yeah, my it's a good way that like, they can they can figure out what they have in him too, right? Like it's strategically, this will be yes. their year to figure out if he's the guy. And you know, that's great. That's perfect. That's what you want. You don't want to get stuck, sort of like hoping a guy will turn out when you have a, a team that's ready to compete otherwise. And so they're not putting themselves in that position. JT, do we want to talk about some fantasy now? Yeah, let's talk about some Titans fantasy guys because, of course, you always have. Um, you have Derrick Henry. Let's just start with him. Of course, every single year, it seems like we say this is the year he falls off a cliff and then <laughs> yeah. he starts out the year. Like it, it's the, it, it happens like clockwork every single year. The first two weeks, oh, he's dead. He's dead, um, man. He's he washed scores like eight to 12 points and he's washed. We're done. And then yeah. you, Derrick Henry starts to get going yeah. and you see him by December. He becomes the, the RB one that everybody knew he was going to be at the beginning of the season. And then, you know, he ends the season as running back four. Now right. he's, he's, he's 29 now. Um, <laughs> and he's, he was running back four. he's probably his last year here in Tennessee. Um, but do you think that with Bijan and some of these other pass catching guys like Austin Eckler or Christian McCaffrey, does he have an argument to be drafted as a top three option this season? Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't, I would put it this way. It would not surprise me if he ends up as a top three running back. I'm not taking him because I'm a coward and <laughs> I'm worried that he's going to fall off a cliff, which is what I've done. This is like refusing Danny, to buy. You are to Derrick Henry what I am to Travis Kelsey. I, I refuse to buy it every <laughs> right. year and I get burned every year. So I, I, I get it. it. I really year. do. This is like refusing to buy Apple stock in the 90s or something because, oh, I can't go up any higher. But like, so I probably will be out on him. We have him ranked right now in half PVR as our RB8 which I think just feels about right. I mean, you know, there's it, it builds in a little bit of a, yeah. a cushion and the idea that he could potentially get less volume this year because they drafted a, a running back. You know, you get maybe Traylon Burks is get, get him going a little bit and they, they pass a little bit more. They're probably 
maybe going to be playing from behind a little bit more than you'd want. Um, although that hasn't really stopped him in the past. Yes. So, um, also Danny counterpoint, have you seen who he ends the year with Houston, yeah. Seattle, Houston, Ooh, big playoff okay. implications here. Wow. Week 15 through 17. He plays Houston twice in Seattle, it which is the math a little bit, which there we go against Houston. He's the past three years. He scored. I think we calculated on the show, like 2000 yards and 45 <laughs> touchdowns. Like he, he just, yeah. he just <laughs> never right. fails to go off against Tennessee or well, against yeah. Houston. What um, was the stat? It was like 200 plus yards in, in how many ever straight games or something like that. I, I think he, I think it did. I, he had his, in his past six year. games against Houston, he's averaged roughly 200 yards and like three <laughs> touchdowns a game. It's crazy. Um, so it's <laughs> yeah. just stupid, but it's a real stat. If, if not to, if you don't draft him, at least he's a good guy to look at maybe at the trade deadline. If, if the team go. who does have Derrick Henry is, is not doing so he's going to well. be the ultimate tampering move, right? It's going to be some, some contender in your league is going to trade mm -hmm. for him in week 15. And it's going to be like, that's not allowed. This person's selling the farm. They're tanking. Um, but it's going to be too bad. Yeah. I'm already planning for this. This is a great <laughs> idea. This is a really good strategy. Um, and maybe he'll start slow and then someone will be like, oh, he fell off a cliff. We knew this was coming. And then as, as he low. does. Yeah. And in, in the second half of the year, when it gets cold, people don't want to tackle anymore. Uh, that's when he does his thing. So, uh, yeah, Henry, I mean, look, the guy is an outlier in size and he's an outlier in a good way. He's, he's the biggest like, running back in the world. Um, and he's really, really fast. So <laughs> expecting him to do like what every other running back does is kind of stupid probably. And that's like what I'm, that's the, the conundrum I'm stuck in. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, uh, it's probably worth gra <laughs> War grabbing crime. Henry. All right, Jacob. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, second second in the league in rushing with no offensive line and no <laughs> wide receivers. I, I mean, I get it. Having him at running back eight, I playing in either half PPR, full PPR. I'm someone who is a little. Uh, he has to fall apart eventually. It's I mean, just yeah, when, right? you would it, think. Um, but he's still someone that I'm going to be. Do we want to talk about the no poor wide what. receiver room that, that yeah, this Titans team has. Of, speaking of the poor wide receiver room, you talked about Traylon Burks. <laughs> yeah. um, he's so confusing to me. Um, it feels like it may have a little bit of a breakout season loading. We see time and time again, these sophomore seasons for a lot of wide receivers, mm -hmm. at least fantasy wise, just like come out of nowhere and then just have crazy seasons. Um, of course, as D good pointed out at the beginning of this, uh, we picked the worst time because the Titans were doing media availability right now. And as we were oh. talking, we were talking draft the Titans uh, picked the worst time. We had yeah, this plan. <laughs> um, Traylon Burks was actually, uh, I picked up bits and pieces of it and he was talking about how he's been in Nashville all summer or oh, all great. through all through the off season. He's changed his diet and said he's, he's been able to run faster cause he can breathe better. So it seems like a lot yeah. of the, the asthma and stuff like that has gone away. <laughs> um, do you think that it could be a breakout season for Traylon Burks and as the wide receiver, one of the Tennessee Titans, what's his like, what do you think his ceiling is fantasy wise? Mm. Well, first off, yeah, that's music to my ears in terms of like, at least he's saying the right things. You know what I mean? Like last year was a bit of a roller coaster to put it mildly in terms of what happened in, in training camp with, he couldn't f like just finish one practice, man. Like for the love of God, please finish <laughs> a practice. Yeah. Um, tough scene. Tough scene. <laughs> it was just like, uh, you know, cause I was a big Burks guy pre pre draft. I really liked him. And then, it felt like, and my big running joke was essentially like to, to Vrabel is like the, the joke from walk hard wrong kid died. Like they traded away wrong kid died. They traded away <laughs> a, AJ Brown. And then he gets stuck with freaking yeah. trailing Burks who can't finish a practice, you know? And, and I think Vrabel immediately like hated him. <laughs> so uh, that was worrisome, but it did feel like throughout the season, or, you know, from the outside, you guys probably know better than this or better than me, but like from the outside, it felt like he kind of at least got on, on Vrabel's good side a little bit more as the season went on. Um, he totally and, did. Yeah. Yeah. It, you know, there was, I think snippets I saw where, you know, they were talking on the sideline and Vrabel was hyping him up and it sounded like, you know, Traylon Burks was working his ass off at least, you know, from a effort standpoint. Um, so yeah, this is all very good to hear that, that he is in, 
you know, he's staying there. He's like working in the off season. He's like trying to get past these conditioning issues that he had clearly coming in. The hope is, and, and the belief based on what he's saying is that, you know, he is learning to be a pro and he obviously was not ready for like the rigors of the NFL when he started last year, maybe that was a wake up call. And so um, I'm generally still very bullish on his, his talent. I think he's a really good player. You think he's an explosive guy and I don't know what a number one in this offense looks like, but you know, a thousand yards, like five or six touchdowns, like this would not be completely shocking. Can I ask you a question along those lines, Danny? Mm -hmm. Cause you're the fantasy football expert, right? How do you, how do you, balance the ideas of when you've got a guy like this who as a player you're kind of high on and you think that the ceiling is really promising um and it's like the the disconnect of well he's in an offense where i'm not sure they're going to throw the ball all that much and it also might be a bad offense but then also who else are they throwing the ball to maybe he just gets right. all of the passes um that's yeah. like that's how it was with cd cd lamb last year in dallas with ravens receivers over the years how do you balance those two ideas I mean, it's difficult. You just kind of have to, well, number one, I just looking at the roster now, it feels like the majority of these, the looks are going to be like Traylon Burks and hopefully Chig Aquanquo, because I think he showed a lot of ability, explosiveness, maybe design yep. the offense around those two guys. And, you know, obviously, you know, Derek Henry on the ground. Um, and then from there, honestly, there's a lot of guys in this depth chart I've not heard of, uh, or I very vaguely know who they are. Like I know who Rick us either, is. and it's our job to know who they are. Yeah, and so it's 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 weird. I think Kyle Phillips is a guy that probably could play a role for them, um, you know, as a slot receiver. But you know, if they're running two receiver or if they're running two receiver sets, he's probably not going to be out on the field. Um, and so, you know, I, I think Burks is it, funnel. He, he has the ability or the potential to be a pass funnel guy. And so that's exciting from a fantasy point of view. They just don't have a lot of other guys here, even though the offense may be low volume in terms of passing, uh, low scoring, you know, obviously is a little bit of a concern, but I still do have faith in Tannehill. I, honestly, I think he's a, he's underrated as a passer, um, you know, and if they can get their, their play action game going, I think Burks is a perfect fit for that because he's so dangerous down the field. And so, um, and run after the catch. So, yeah, I think, you know, get him on those A.J. Brown style plays where he's running a slant, running after the catch. And, you know, I think you could get pretty good production out of him, especially if he's in shape and, and you know, sort of taking it more seriously this offseason. I think, the you know, sky's kind of the limit for him. They picked him in the first round. They obviously believe in him, uh, although I guess now the GM is gone. But um, still, the wrong kid died. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, to, to that point, there was one more there was one more quote today that is just the like if if, if Traylon Burks isn't under Vrabel's thumb now, I don't know what to tell you. But like he came out. I saw one thing on Twitter as we were talking. It, Burks said, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to be fast, physical and versatile, which is like the, the, he's like is maybe just Vrabel talking through Traylon yeah. Burks there. Um, but <laughs> I see, had I him on see. The, he's had him on the, the, the brainwashing machine all off season. He's got Love him where he wants it. him. Love um, that. But I see him right now as probably a flex wide receiver three with some wide receiver two upside, because like mm -hmm. you said, it, this, this offense is pretty tricky to look at someone that I maybe am a little too high on as, as you were talking about Chiga Conquo, the Prince that was no promised thing, as baby. we, as we talk <laughs> about him on this show, we call him our little Prince that was promised. Mm -hmm. He was someone that just like, he had just like a career tight end season for rookies as far as that goes. And it feels like no one talks about it enough. Like mm -hmm. he had a 0.35 EPA per, per target nine or 7.9 .9 yards after the catch per reception last year, 30 receptions. Yeah. Um, this tweet came out like in February, Warren Sharp put it together. He's up there with, there's been five players in the last five years who've, who has done stuff like that with the likes of Jamar chase, Debo Samuel, AJ Brown, and another tight end, George Kittle. Mm -hmm. Like this guy has the tools to do it. And we were banging on the table all season for Todd Downing to get the ball get the to the ball. and it and it did not and it did not work of course yeah now that uh tim kelly is the offensive coordinator <laughs> and who we found out like during the season like he was like a like assistant to todd downing but like mainly was only working with tight ends throughout the week like mm. you hopefully want to see him now maybe have a breakout season i personally would not mind drafting chigaconquo as like a tight end nine or ten 
Like mm-hmm. he, he's someone that I think could be in the top 10 this season because I do just 17 believe touchdowns, 2,100 yards. Book yeah, it. exactly. Just so much <laughs> like, of course, it's going to be a very deep fantasy draft with a lot of these rookie tight ends who have some promise, but like, I would not be surprised to see Chig in that tight end seven to tight end 10 range by the end of the season. Yeah, I love that. Um, we've got him ranked, I guess, relatively conservatively as our tight end 13, but I, I share your optimism um, because, I mean, again, I'll say every time he touched the football, it felt like it was a 40 yard gain. I, I don't think. And, and if you look at like the number yes. of 30 plus yard gains, he was like in rarefied air in terms of his ability to create those explosive plays. Like you'd think you'd want to get the ball into that guy's hands a little bit more with he can you'd think can... that wouldn't you <laughs> <laughs> um so you know this is this is what we do we we question what coaches are thinking constantly and obviously that was what I, what I was doing with arthur smith even though i do recognize and realize he's a good offensive coach i just think um you know to me coaches probably don't make a big enough focus on getting the ball into the hands of like their big guys like get they want to run their offense. I would say like, just get the ball into the playmaker's hands as much as you possibly can. Like that would be my number one goal as a play caller. So um, hopefully that happens here. You know, uh, that's music to my ears again, that you're saying about uh, Tim Kelly and and coaching tight ends. And hopefully that like translates. Um, But, but yeah, I mean, and, and this comment here from Jacob in terms of like picking a guy with upside to create explosive plays, he's athletic. This is a big joke on our show. Like chick, like, every tight end is athletic, but that's not true. There's gray area. Like there's, there's levels to it. And and a is extremely athletic. He's essentially a big receiver and getting him out there in space, letting him do his thing after the catch, big physicality. Um, There's a lot to like there. And, and especially in an offense that is pretty barren otherwise in terms of skill players. And so, yeah, this is like, again, one of those things you look back next year and and be like, why didn't we see this coming? Like we probably should have seen this coming. So um, he is a, I think he's a great pick. Um, you know, like in terms of like hoping for that upside. And and to that point, I mean, you saw in, in the off season, how the Titans were kind of targeting those chiefs offensive minds to maybe come in here and be that offensive coordinator with a Matt Nagy or something. I mean, it, it's not too far fetched to say that they didn't draft a wide receiver mostly because they want to go with like the San Francisco or Kansas city type mm-hmm. of style where your tight end one plays that wide receiver two role in your oh, offense. Based on what I've heard from inside the building. I mean, that is, that is their plan. They they are going to utilize Chig in a massive way in the passing game this year. Ooh, and it, 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 it's, we, we hope to see it. And so that's why I'm so high. Another guy that I'm sneaky high on is Ty J Spears, the running back that they drafted mm. in the third round. Um, maybe it's just because I saw him playing in the slot at Ricky minicamp and everybody was <laughs> right. so mad at it, but I was like banging the table. Like, yes, this is what I want to see. Um, I, I think he will be, they've, they've done this in the past with at the beginning of the season last year. And in the past with Dontrell Hilliard and guys like that. And, um, that's how they get their offense moving down the field is just having Hilliard their... led the team in touchdowns by the midway point last year. People yeah. don't realize that <laughs> uh, like, yeah, I remember in the that, red yeah. zone. They want it. They throw to their running backs in the red zone. I don't know why. Um, it, he looks to be a passing game threat. Um, so maybe like a late round grab. If you're, if you're a guy that wants to play like a zero RB strategy mm-hmm. or something like that, but m- more so you, you talked about him and his kind of role here with Derrick Henry. How how much do you think he will be a factor in stealing from Derrick Henry's production? Pr- production? We see him mainly as like a third down back, of course. Mm-hmm. Um, but do you think that he poses a real threat to Henry's production this season? Uh, I would... I would guess no in terms of a real threat. I would, I would, I think the logical answer would be no. Like the way that the Titans have utilized Henry in the past in terms of like, yeah. he's the engine of their offense. Like he, he get, you know, it, he makes it hard for defenses just because he beats you up throughout the, throughout a game. Um, you know, I'd say he's still going to be like the, the high volume type of player, but um, you know, I think we did see Henry's like, explosive play rate i want to say like went down pretty substantially last year you know maybe they have an idea where they want to get him keep him a little bit fresher as the year goes on uh, and really utilize him late in the season and and hopefully he you know that will extend his career and and all those things work together and i think that's a big reason that they probably made this pick and so i can see him being a change of pace guy maybe they alternate um 
drives and he's not just a a third down guy but i don't know if 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 henry's healthy i wouldn't expect like huge volume from spears but i do think he's going to be you know utilized as a change pace guy slash pass catching guy um and you know maybe he's worth a flex like he might end up being a flexible option just because um they're trying to get you know some more rest for henry throughout the season so i, I could see that happening but yeah big volume I, probably i see not. that yeah and where my mind at is at right now is kind of like two years ago Tariq Cohen for the bears kind mm. of like before he became mm. that like main guy last year due, due to injuries or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's kind of, I kind of project him to be that guy that's going to be a threat in the passing game. So if you were like, if you trust in PPR and like are a PPR nut and want the one that want the receptions, like give me all of them. I think he's yeah. a good guy in the later rounds. Absolutely. All right, I think that's it for today. So, Danny, thank you so so much for your time. S- sell what your work. What do you guys going go, got going on at the Ringer right now? I know the fantasy guide just came out, right? Yep. So we got the Ringer Fantasy Football Draft Guide that is going to be. It's already up. We're going to be adding to it, adding analysis throughout the summer. By the time July rolls around, we're going to have a bunch of profiles up there and a bunch of uh, different functions that we can use that you can use while drafting. Basically, you can like use our rankings and you can check off guys when they get drafted. So it's a very cool um, system. And then awesome. I also have dynasty rankings up there for rookies in terms of, well, I have full dynasty and rookie rankings up there. If you're playing dynasty, if you're doing rookie drafts this, this off season, uh, go check those out. I would use that as a roadmap. Obviously, you know, team needs are going to dictate here and there what you want to do, but that's a, I think it's a good roadmap for what you want to do there. Um, and yeah, we got the ringer fantasy football show two or one time a week. Uh, during this lull, during the off season here. And then we're going to start ramping it up to multiple times a week in July, I believe. So yeah, that's what we got going on right now. That's awesome. Guys, go check out Danny and all the awesome work that everybody does over at the ringer, the ringer NFL podcast content is some of the only content that I live and breathe by. I I never (laughs) miss an episode. They do an awesome job and truly it is one of the shows that you can just laugh at, even if you don't care what they're talking about, because these guys are hilarious. So um, definitely (laughs) go, go and check, go and check them out. Danny, thank you so much for your time, man. Hopefully we run into you again down the road and have a great summer. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. I love all the little tidbits and nuggets you guys have on the, on the Titans. I'm excited about Chig now. Absolutely. Well, for Danny and producer JT, I'm your host, Easton Freeze. This has been the Hot Read Podcast. We'll talk to you again on Friday as usual. Until then, have a great rest of your week.